My aim today is really to discuss some ideas, to present some ideas, um, some thoughts on the management of shoulder dystocia um, so that we hopefully can help improve practice and indeed uh, uh, develop into guidance or even guidelines uh, that will actually be improvement. And I'd like to acknowledge, um, this has been an ongoing um, area which I've been interested in, and acknowledge not only my colleagues, midwifery and obstetric at uh, Hollis Street, but also in other hospitals as we've um, worked on it. And it's a continually changing uh, uh, thing. But I think there may be some things that would be of interest to people, hopefully, and we'll take it from, uh, from there. Now, as with everything on the, on the delivery ward, to me, it comes down to two things, safety first and simplicity second. And yes, we can talk about outcomes, and safety indeed is, is an outcome in a way, but uh, safety has become such a big issue nowadays that I think we should uh, think of it slightly separately. And I'm talking about safety, obviously, for the baby and mother, but I'm also talking about the staff. Um, the effects on the staff of a really severe shoulder dystocia can be quite significant. Even uh, 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 documentation of, of uh, physical injuries, never mind emotional injuries. And I think the simplicity second bit is that most things on the labor ward, in my view at least, that works well, have to be simple. And no more so than this uh, uh, is in shoulder dystocia, where the diagnosis, the training, the documentation, organization and auditing clinical governance are the, the main issues. And uh, you could say that there are main issues for every aspect of, uh, of the delivery ward, for example, oxytocin and things like that. But it's got to be safe and simple, and we've got to have some consensus of it. I'm not very good at mnemonics, and I know people have presented mnemonics, and if they're useful, then by all means use them. But I have a problem actually remembering the mnemonic sometimes as, and not only that, and what they actually stand for. So I think, you know, we've got to recognize that. But what works for one may not work for another, and I'm not by any means discluding it. But I do think that you have to have some thoughts about shoulder dystocia uh, or thoughts about any situation. Look, and I've put down, don't panic. And it may be an extreme way of saying it, but, you know, certainly... There are a lot of things that go wrong by people reacting very strongly. Now, that's a natural reaction, and you could call it, you know, being stressed out or, or otherwise. But I think it's one of the most important points in emergencies or any emergency on the, on the delivery ward. And we've got to think a little bit differently about how we train people for this and how we deal with it. And, you know, the first aspect comes by training them well. But also, I think, psychologically, you've got to think about it. It's almost like I remember the days when you heard a shoulder dystocia and uh, somebody put their hand out, I'll go for help, I'll go for help, and, and leave everybody on their own. I think we've got to change that around sometime to put their hands up and say, look, it's my turn today. I want to deal with it. And I think that comes by careful consideration and thought and putting... Uh, um, uh, our efforts into trying to make sure that the staff are well trained. Indeed, I bet you this is what Paul McGinley was saying uh, on his team talk, not only on Friday, uh, uh, but also on Saturday night, that, look, we can do this, guys, but the most likely reason for something going wrong is that we panic or overreact, and it's very important. So that's the first thought, and I would emphasize that again. And also with shoulder dystocia, and once you've got a shoulder dystocia, I'm not talking about preoptive, you've got to get into your mindset, I think, that delivery is going to occur by rotation rather than traction. Obviously, to a certain extent, it will deliver if you pull hard enough and if 10 other people help you when you're tired. Um, but if you want to balance the, the uh, effect of not only injury to the baby but also to the mother, once you've not managed to deliver the baby easily, you've got to think in your mindset, this is uh, rotation. And you've got to think differently rather than just pulling, because pulling obviously is a natural reaction. And then lastly, working together. I know somebody, and Eve is going to talk about uh, uh, working together, but I think that's a very important issue, and I'll come back to that later on where I think we can do better in terms of uh, shoulder dystocia. Let's start with the diagnosis and definition, and most people would give something like this, not necessarily including vaginal deliveries, but it's important, as, as we all know, to get the right denominator. But the problem with diagnosis uh, as defined by that is it's almost a retrospective decision. 
a definition of a diagnosis, whether it's labor or otherwise, has to be prospective. You have to go with your best uh, uh, definition and you have to make a decision. And it's only looking back and then that you can have consistent data. If you only do it afterwards, well, it's too late to do anything about it. It doesn't affect how you manage. Um, and uh, in terms of audit, you're, you're just dealing with abstract definition, which isn't very useful. Now, I'm going to make a suggestion. and. Um, in various places, I've come out with what I think should be recommendations, and I would recommend this, but it's up to everybody to decide. Uh, one failed attempt in a downward traction, I think, should be defined as shoulder dystocia. And what I mean by definition of shoulder dystocia is, in the end, it may come out without any problems. There may not be issues. But that is a time in the process of events that you can affect things and change things, call for help before there's a problem. If you leave it too late for whatever other reason, then not only can you not affect it, help comes too late. And what I uh, um, was referring to earlier, you, you create a completely different situation. Now, yes, you may have a higher incidence. You may have all kinds of things uh, that, that are interpreted when comparison may result in, in, in difficulties. But I think if you're consistent with your definition and methodologically sound and you use the same definition, I think that would be helpful. Now, there are two other situations. Uh, a baby was delivered at the first attempt but was difficult. Well, if it is delivered at the first attempt but it was difficult, usually there isn't a clinical problem or scenario, but you may have to think of that. Uh, you may also have to think that neither of these applied but the baby's head delivered but you're worried that shoulder dystocia may occur because of this sign that we all know as turtling or previous history or known large for dates. And I think if we audit those uh, uh, three groups separately, I think that'd be uh, very useful. But again, the most common situation is, is that situation. And I certainly think by convention that should be our, our, our definition, uh, uh, certainly uh, initially. Now, we are getting better at teaching maneuvers, and uh, I think, you know, there's no doubt that we know more about it, and we're trying these um, with mannequins and, and, and other things and in groups of people. And I just want to run through this quickly because it's not going to be a, a huge part of the talk, but there are some important points that I want to make. I do think that this image is very useful to have in your mind. I, I think it really describes the problem um, better than any words uh, could do. And by the way, I use left OA to describe a baby that is delivered uh, occipital anterior and turns to the, uh, or the occiput certainly turns to the left and looks to the left, because I think I'll come back to this again and again. It is probably the most common way babies deliver. They, they end up uh, restituting in that way. And it's very important, actually, to differentiate, in my opinion, the ones that look one way as opposed to the ones that look the other way, because the back is on, a, on the opposite side, obviously, and the maneuvers, or indeed the hand that you use, is different. But I think this image is very important. It really does show what the main problem is, and it's in the anterior shoulder and there's this kind of blunt hook effect which may be greater or less depending on the position that the mother's uh, legs is in and, and, and what, cause, what uh, ends up with a, with a problem. I think it's very important to have this image of Matt Roberts position and by the way I haven't gone into you know removing the end of the bed and, 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 and other details which are very important and part of the organization but let's leave that for, for the moment but it's very important to actually have this image of what Matt Roberts uh, uh, does and it should allow the baby instead of having to go down and up which may occur in a, in a, in a normal delivery when the mother's uh, prone on the bed as opposed to this where it can go straight out um, and should be easier at least to deliver the baby and likewise there's some thoughts that M Mac Roberts position also contributes to rotation of the baby which actually helps as well and is an important part of, if you like, the, 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 the timeline of a vagina delivery to wait for the baby's head to, to restitute before you do any um, other procedures, which sometimes is a, is a problem when you certainly look at certain videos on the internet and see how people deal with shoulder dystocia, that you see the situation of the baby come down, you suddenly get worried, and what do you do? You just panic and you just kind of think I have to uh, uh, do something usually ending up with pulling and usually ending up with a, an injury to the baby. I think the suprapubic pressure uh, and there is some discussion on this but I, I see it as you know there's a left OA baby and a right OA baby and 
as I understand suprapubic pressure, but some people, and you'll always look in the literature and see, have different opinions. If this is a rotational procedure that you're looking at, that it's a rotational thing, you're trying to push the shoulders to reduce the bicromial uh, diameter of the shoulders, and therefore it seems more, com uh, more common sense to actually push it towards uh, the, the way that the baby uh, is facing and the face of the baby. Um, and that really suprapubic pressure pushing the shoulders uh, uh, down to try and unhook it sometimes isn't the way to go. There's also discussion of whether it should be intermittent. I prefer constant pressure in that direction. But again, this is a maneuver that should be occurring, uh, uh, um, if you like, um, um, routinely in the sense that people should be thinking of it, but should be um, carried out um, bearing in mind what else is going on at the same time as, as well. Um, and then you get on to manipulation to rotate the shoulders, and this is where you get all these names of these different kind of processes and uh, 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 rotational. And I think, I mean, the names and the different processes are irrelevant. There are a certain number of procedures and processes you should deal with. This is, um, uh, whatever name it is, is trying to sweep the left shoulder um, um, anterior, um, um, the, uh, sorry, the le um, left shoulder, yes, um, and to sweep it out and to rotate it in a left OA baby. They use the right hand there, but if you imagine using your right hand like that, it is actually very difficult to do that. And I would suggest that you use your left hand and you sweep in a more natural direction. Which hand you use in uh, delivering shoulder dystocia babies, depending on where the shoulders are, um, um, is very important in that you can actually injure yourself, but you've also got restrictions of, uh, of movements. Uh, again, delivery of a left eye baby, and this is a picture taken from another book which actually shows it is the left hand that you're using. And it could only be that hand because anatomically that fits in much better. So again, the right hand sweeping over the top or the left hand sweeping underneath to try and rotate the baby um, uh, during the process. Again, with delivery of the um, posterior arm, if you're going to that, again, for a baby left OA, you try and use the left arm to, or left hand, your left hand to deliver the baby, trying to reach out and, if possible, get hold of the hand. But indeed, if you can't, you know, try and get your arm in the axilla and to try and pull outwards. And sometimes that, unfortunately, does result in a fracture of the humerus, but it isn't an injury, although maybe more uh, concerning to the mother, uh, that uh, it heals much better than, uh, than a, a brachial um, uh, palsy. And again, very similar for the, uh, the, the baby with the right OA where you use your right hand. And not only is it easier to draw that diagram, it's easier actually to do in, in that sense. So my way of thinking is forget the names, let's just teach the two-handed approach to manipulation of shoulders and delivery of the posterior shoulder the left OA baby facing to the mother's right, right hand sweeping over, left hand sweeping underneath, and the opposite for the uh, 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 right OA baby. And this is what is illustrated with pictures. So some kind of rotational thing all, all the time. And I think that's something that certainly I can remember, and I don't know whether it's easier for other people to remember than thinking a particular maneuver, interpret it in your mind, and then try and carry it out. And again, emphasizing shoulder dystocia should not be delivered by rotation. Um, um, it should be delivered by rotation, sorry, uh, not uh, traction. Now, the working together element is, I think, becoming more and more the most important part. And I'd like to present to you two scenarios for the occurrence of shoulder dystocia. The clinician, in one, the clinician has been at the delivery from the beginning. And in the other, a clinician arrives after delivery of the head. And I think this is very important, and often when you look at cases and you read notes, even from your own unit, this is where uh, 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 most problems can occur, certainly in handing over or knowing exactly where you are. And the times are crucial, and the times are crucial because they influence what you do and when you do it according to how long the process has gone out. So if not present from the delivery, find out about timings and number of downward tractions as soon as possible after arriving. So when you come into the room, you should need to find that out. Or indeed, if you come into the room as the clinician that's going to take over, that information should be given to you and we're all thinking along the same uh, timeline. And again, another recommendation that I think is important, and you may consider this 
um, well, you may consider it every way you like, but I'd be interested to your views, is I think now all vaginal deliveries, whether you suspect shoulder dystocia or not, should immediately be noted. You see, look at the clock, look at the, uh, as soon as the head is, is born, and you look what time it is in minutes and seconds, and you get used to that. Now, 99% of the time, you won't have a shoulder dystocia, but if you do know that minutes and seconds, you will know what the time element and what's happening. And if something does occur um, and you come into the room, knowing, for example, well, um, the baby's head delivered one minute ago, we haven't yet done the first traction, you know exactly where you are. And depending on that and whatever you've seen, you decide whether you go for one more traction, you decide whether you go for rotation, super pubic pressure, Mike Roberts, or whatever, or indeed, in some instances, you may go straight for the posterior arm. By the way, all these slides will be available and they are also, from my point of view, you can use them to yourselves. Uh, I've got no problem about people using them. So I would suggest to you that you have a timeline of a vaginal delivery. Now please don't get too excited about the individual times. It's a template upon which you can base and it will be not completely the same each time. And I always think that in, in a situation where you are in a position of stress, the other example I can think where the, the, the baby's head is stuck and you're trying to get a, a baby out, one of the best things to do is to look at something objective where you can just rest. And there's nothing better than a clock. And indeed, if you're giving a lecture like this, you always look around for where the clock is because you can measure how you're doing and where you're going with your talk. Just the same in a stressful situation, whether in the labor uh, ward or in theater, and you know what, uh, uh, how many minutes are going by. Because minutes don't always go as quickly as you think, and sometimes you've got more time. But what I'm suggesting is, in a normal delivery, there's a delivery of the head, um, just uh, in, in the terms of uh, uh, vaginal, uh, spontaneous vaginal delivery, cephalic presentation. And in the first minute, you should record the delivery time. You think which way the baby is facing or which way it's going to restitute, and you wait for the next contraction. That should, in my view, be paramount unless the baby is actually, you know, obviously delivering itself and then you deliver it. But that's not the problem with shoulder dystocia. On the first contraction, the next contraction, it's usually about a minute, but again, that may vary. But it's, it's very interesting just to look at deliveries and actually see what a normal delivery, how long it takes and how long you wait, or indeed how long the contraction uh, takes to become. You attempt the first normal downward traction, that would be the normal situation, with or without Matt Roberts or subic pressure if you're concerned. I'm not, I don't want to make a big issue of that, but if no success, you wait for the next contraction, but you call for help, and you declare that as shoulder dystocia, even though you think that it may come uh, next time around. Uh, everybody comes in, everybody gets ready, everybody knows when they come in where they are in the process, and that is very, very helpful and very reassuring. It's a very objective way of, of immediately communicating, but everybody has to be thinking the same way. And you wait for the second contraction, usually about two minutes, sometimes a little bit earlier, sometimes a little bit late. But you know you're only going two minutes. There's no absolute reason to panic at this stage, and you're waiting. And in that time, the baby hopefully is restituting itself too. And then you decide whether to attempt a second downward traction, which I think uh, 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 is, is certainly very uh, reasonable, or go straight to a manipulative procedure. I haven't put this down as a recommendation, but after second downward traction, no more downward traction. That's not an absolute, but it's something that you should really think about before you do a third one, because it's that downward traction or that failed downward traction or delivery that is causing the, the damage to the baby. And I'm not saying in exceptional circumstances you may have to do that, but certainly you should then go to um, uh, other maneuvers um, uh, um, to try and decide what to do. And that is in the two to four minutes. Now, obviously, some of those maneuvers aren't best done while there is a contraction, but I wouldn't wait to a third minute. Once the contraction is gone, or whether it's possible to get access we had, go to the other rotational movements or delivery of the posterior arm. Think which hand you use, depending on which the way the baby is. And after four minutes, you should have delivered the baby, or at least be close. But sometimes it can be four, sometimes it can be five minutes. But if you understand what I'm trying to get the idea of, you've got this objective time period, everybody knows what's going on, and you're making decisions what to do and when to do. We've been concentrating on what actually to do, and I'm not sure whether we've been thinking enough when to do it and to make sure that we all uh, do it to, 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 together. 
So arrival after the baby's head is delivered, when was the delivery of head, which way is the baby facing, how many attempts have been made to deliver with downward tractions, and the times are crucial. It focuses your mind and influences what you do. And if you come in and three contractions, th two attempts have been done, or maybe even three, you don't go and pull again, you go straight to a, a, a more definitive procedure that will deliver the baby. The problem about the baby's, uh, timing of the baby's head is unless we do it for all deliveries, it won't work. And so that's the challenge if we can actually uh, uh, do that. Other practical points, episiotomy, well, I mean, episiotomy has got nothing to do with shoulder dystocia, but it does uh, uh, pr um, allow access. Removal of the end of the bed, delivery on all fours. Again, delivery on all fours, and, and there are some people who are very strong supporters of that, but it does limit what you can do if it doesn't work. So um, I haven't got very little, I haven't got very much experience of that, and I haven't got experience of symphysiotomy or Zavinella maneuver either, but... Um, they have been reported, as everybody knows, and everybody remembers Zavanelli. Uh, it, never mind anything else. Um, documentation, finally. The challenge really is combining routine notes with audit, with teaching, education, and research, and somehow to put all this together so you don't duplicate uh, uh, things. And I often think that, you know, sometimes there's a shoulder dystocia, you get everybody in rushing into the room. And uh, then when everything has died down and there's been a chaotic event or whatever, it's often the initial person, usually the, often the midwife maybe, that has been left with a blank page to write out the notes. Not only is it the wrong time to do it, but there's no help doing it, and nobody that's changing nowadays, looks at it to see whether um, it's been filled out, even from an objective point of view. And there's huge advantages of somebody actually not having been there to read the notes to see whether it, uh, it makes sense. And uh, you probably can't see this, but again, I suggest that this is a recommendation, a strong recommendation, that you have some kind of template to write what happened. I think a visual template is more useful, it's easier to fill in and you can uh, 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 um, um, circle it or time it or put the timings. There's hours, minutes and seconds for those. This, in, certainly in our hands, is always changing all the time. Um, and also, um, um, it is a template only and by all means write a bit of extra free text. But there should be only one documentation of the shoulders, those in the notes not five or six, and it should be the same. So it should be, again, remember what I said about working together, a multidisciplinary thing, and all the people involved should write it, agree it, and then sign it off. Um, and I think that would be uh, uh, very helpful and is a very strong recommendation, which really makes it so much easier. If you look at the notes of a shoulder dystocia, and you've got something like this, is before you've even given an opinion or look at things, you look at this and think, well, they, they have a certain element of quality care in, in that delivery unit. Now, again, recommendations, uh, but it is difficult to carry this out. We would have about 100, 1% uh, shoulder dystocia cases a year, about 100 cases. It is a benefit, it is important, and it would be a recommendation if the shoulder dystocia is document, uh, documentation is uh, verified by somebody who wasn't there on the day, by a senior clinician. There should be multidisciplinary case discussion of the cases, and to a certain extent we're going all the way to doing all these drills, etc., and things like that. But if you have a shoulder dystocia case and you get the individual that was involved with a supportive um, um, audience to go through, describe how they felt, what were their problems, it's a huge, huge learning uh, experience for everybody. And the drills may be all very well, and I'm not saying we should discount them, but that should happen as well. Um, there should be a disciplined follow-up and debriefing of the cases, not necessarily the day afterwards, Certainly the mother should be cared for and, and should be spoken to the day afterwards, but you should always realize that sometimes the information isn't best taken by the mother the day afterwards. They're worried, sometimes can be worried about the baby, and an opportunity to see them at another stage whenever it suits them as, as much as you is very important. As far as audit, I have a strong view that brachial plexus injuries at birth, that's all very well, but the biggest uh, uh, um, audit is 
brachial plexus injuries or any other permanent injuries at six months because a lot of injuries uh, are only temporary. They're sometimes um, um, vaguely described at the times of birth and they're, they're obviously not always as significant as others. But the six month mark is a time and that means we have to work with um, other institutions, CRC, and there should be follow up in my uh, view and it's sometimes difficult to get those cases back but those cases should go back to the hospital so they have a complete audit cycle of what happened. And obviously we should include this in our annual formal clinical report. So the last slide. Um, Always expect shoulder dystocia, but never panic. Everybody must know what to do, but somebody must be decisive and lead. When was delivery of head? Which way is the baby facing? And how many attempts have been made to deliver with downward traction? You come in. The notes must be organized, immediate, and checked. Uh, thank you very much.